Welcome to the J. Kim Show, Hong Kong's first dedicated podcast on investing in Asia. Join us as we survey the land and discover the greatest companies and most profitable investment opportunities in Asia. If this is your first time listening, thank you for stopping by. This podcast is produced every week with the goal of providing actionable insights to you, the listener, with every single episode. And now, on to the show. We have a unique guest on the show today by the name of Ash Chan. Ash is a Los Angeles-based artist, restaurateur, and entrepreneur. Ash has a very unique background. His family is originally from Hong Kong, and they are one of the largest real estate developers here. But instead of following into his family's traditional business line, Ash decided to work on creative projects in real estate. His latest project is a rare, large-scale creative space and innovation lab called The Container Yard. The Container Yard used to be an old Japanese mochi factory, a large warehouse space, and Ash has now transformed this into a unique creative space which directly contributes to the local economy in Los Angeles. Let's get right on to the show. Hey Ash, how's it going man? Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, we appreciate you having you on, and um, you have a slightly different background and unique. So I'm um, I'm very happy to have you. You know, we usually have just straight up hardcore entrepreneurs and, and investors uh, and that sort of thing on the show. So uh, it's always good to have a little bit of a variety, if you will. Um, maybe you could give us a little bit of a quick uh, background and introduction of yourself. So definitely um, feel like uh, I'm I'm a little bit of an alternative. Uh... <laughs> item in comparison. Um, born and raised in Boston um, and then moved to Taiwan and Shanghai when I was in high school and then um, sort of ended up in California after, you know, a bunch of years and, um, you know, just done a bunch of really random things that were, I think, really experimental for some of our family business. Um, you know, opening restaurants was sort of a real estate kind of experiment um, and sort of through, you know, a lot of experimentation, you know, we've done a lot of really interesting and sort of creative things that didn't always make money, um, but were <laughs> really interesting, uh, really interesting exercises in, in sort of creative business. Yeah, I feel like the holy grail of being an artist or sort of doing things creative is where you can actually monetize off it. I feel like there's like a, a like a, a graph, a spectrum, so to speak, where the more creative you get or you get pulled in that direction, uh, potentially the less lucrative it could be. But then the people that few people that do crack it, like, you know, musicians and actors and this sort of thing, they tend to do extremely well. So yeah, growing up, though, was there was your family pretty supportive of I mean, what was your what was your childhood like? I mean, was it very traditional sort of Asian family or uh, some so somewhat I went you know I, I changed a lot of schools and you know I think this I just came back from Boston I think it was one of the first times that I sort of talked to my parents about right. parenting me and how they made some of their decisions you know um, and right. you know I went to all boys school first to fifth grade I went to another sort of prep school sixth grade and then seventh to ninth another one and you know sort of all these different Definitely uh, amongst the sort of more Yankee, <laughs> upper crust, um, Bostonian, you know, uh, I was definitely, you know, I was one of the only Asian kids, you know, in the mix. Um, but I, I really appreciate, you know, the, the sort of the opportunities and sort of being put in that situation, because I think that definitely was um, at least, at least help with some, uh, sort of a aspirational standard, you know, um, all these kids, parents were sure. doctors and lawyers and, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, the things that basically society, and especially like, you know, being Asian and, you know, first generation, my parents were first generation immigrants into the U S and they, they had a, I had an idea that, uh, you know, if you get the most stable job and then it's the, the best thing for you because they struggled when they first came here. I'm, I'm sure it's quite similar. Um, but at the same time, you know, I mean, coming from so, sort of a large real estate family background, was it expected that you would join the family business and just go down that route? Or 
was there resistance there when you decided that maybe that wasn't exactly? I think my father was also sort of, you know, like somewhat of an anomaly to the family business. Like um, he was a, you know, PhD and, and, and so he, he was sort of, sort of pursuing more academic things initially. And mm-hmm. I think for me, my father never put any pressure on me or any expectation, you know, and obviously we were growing up in, in, in America and my cousins are growing up in Hong Kong. Um, so there wasn't necessarily that sort of pressure of, you know, going back to Asia or, you know, any of that. And, um, I think for, for, I think on the family side, I think my father was also a representation of a certain sense of freedom and trust in my father's endeavors in, in sort of, finding some other creative business or outlets, you know, for the family business, you know, in America. Um, so it, it, yeah, it was, I, I think there was never any pressure like from my father at all. Um, but I think very much like his situation, you know, he sort of extended that to me as the same. That's pretty cool. So what did you end up sort of studying in school and this sort of thing uh, that led you to where you are? General junk. Like, I mean, I, I did UCLA. I took five years that, you know, I just, I was, <laughs> I was like hanging out, you know, I mean, just, um, you know, having a good time. And uh, I did international development studies and business administration minor. So it was like a major that kind of really, you know, didn't, have that many requirements so I could kind of just pick my way through and, and, you know, and then, and then I kind of, a few years later, I ended up going to grad school in the UK and doing a master's in, um, in real estate development. And, you know, obviously the schooling was a lot more meaningful when, you know, I, I had an interest in it as opposed to sort of not really knowing where, where, where the education was leading. And then, so tell us a little bit about your first, venture entrepreneurial venture if you will when i, when I was a little kid i was uh, i bought gerbo jeans like in uh <laughs> in on off of uh, in in uh, in uh, kowloon and i would i brought him back to america and i sold it it was actually that was i bought all those seconds you know yes. i'm you guy you know and <laughs> and uh, that was the first that was like one of the first businesses uh you know honestly we the the That's first so business was was really restaurants. Um, that was the first business that my family, you know, sort of gave me the reins to sort of embark on something completely different and, and sort of undertake something completely foreign to the family. Um, and we definitely learned some lessons through the restaurants. (laughs) Um, yeah, that was the first one. Well, that's a, that's one of the hardest businesses. Was it in Boston that you opened your first restaurant? No, it was in, so it was in uh, Costa Mesa was the first one, which I partnered with a buddy of mine, Leonard. Um, and that one went well, you know, and, and, you know, it was, it was piggybacking off of the overflow of the original founders restaurant, which wasn't too far away. But, you know, again, it had a high Asian population. It was Shabu Shabu. So um, it, anyways, it, it, it was it was we replicated it in a couple ah, other cities right. and it was a really tough business to replicate if you didn't have a heavy Asian population. Um, and so we we learned our lesson very quickly. <laughs> we had to shut them down. We had to shut down the other two restaurants. <laughs> yeah. And then and then from there, what, what was the next step in your entrepreneurial journey? You know, honestly, the, so the restaurant was the restaurant was definitely a failure point. We we thought, you know, wow, let, let's if we wanted to still do something in food, you know, we started doing pop-ups. We we're like, what if we were to do something that was more conceptual and, you know, like didn't have the encumbrance of the large footprint or the real estate cost. And so we built a liquid nitrogen ice cream container to so like a 20 foot shipping container that we fa- had fabricated wow. and designed and turned into a liquid nitrogen ice cream shop that we plopped onto Harvard University's Science Center campus courtyard. That was an interesting, you know, again, <laughs> lessons learned, you know, we had a lot of fun. That was another, <laughs> anyways. <laughs> uh, yeah, so many ideas. So interesting to me because, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just these ideas though. Where did, I mean, how did you conceive these ideas? You I mean, a lot of them were really like sort of response to some of the weaknesses that we saw. The restaurant, you know, it was high cost of development. It was big, you know, big real estate, long leases, you know, just high risk, you know, and 
So we wanted to do something food related that we might be able to plug into some of my father's properties. You know, his company was buying, you know, properties in Boston and we were thinking, wow, well, what if we could create some micro concepts that might be able to sort of shoehorn themselves into into sort of real estate, you know, pieces, even that were maybe partially in development that might be able to service temporarily. Right. So the container thing was a big thing that, you know, I don't know, just something I got enamored with and, you know, sort of wanted to do everything with shipping containers. And that was the first shipping container endeavor that we sort of undertook. That's pretty cool. Actually, shipping containers, I, I read an article recently about like people in Silicon Valley now living in shipping containers because their real estate prices are so high. It's interesting that one of the biggest problems initially with shipping containers was that a lot of neighborhoods didn't allow them because they didn't classify them as sort of like housing or as structures. So it, there wasn't sort of a appreciable value. It, it was still looked at as raw land as opposed to, you know, sort of a built out housing structure. So anyways, there's a, a lot of things have changed, you know, and I think there's a there's a time and a place. I mean, we've we've done a lot of concepts with containers and I think, you know, ultimately a hybrid of container and traditional building is really kind of where there's a there's kind of like a balance like between the two. Right. So so with the real estate background and now you've obviously, you know, there it seems like there's always been some sort of artistic element. And where did that come from? Like where did this sort of artistic edge that you have how did that sort of get cultivated from a younger age? Yeah, it's interesting. I don't know. You know, my my mom, I spent a lot of time with my, my mom. My dad was always busy. So I spent a lot of time with my mom. She was she was uh, sort of an artist who was in New York. Initially, she was drawing those like Jay Peterman, like catalogs, like those fashion catalogs where, you know, you'd like buy clothing, but it was actually hand drawn, not photographed. Mm. <laughs> And um, and so she would always help me on my art projects. And I think there was right, right, right. there was definitely a, a, a sense of um, I remember building a Tiananmen Square diorama when I was a kid and uh, I had built a tank and my mom helped me make the little man holding the two, <laughs> the two plastic bags standing in front of the tank, you know, like and so there was. There was always uh, there was always some kind of creative element, I guess. That's very cool. So let's talk about your latest and greatest project. So at, at some point, you decided to focus on uh, the West Coast. And how did you come up with this idea of the container yard, which is a very, very cool concept? Uh, kind of reminds me of... Uh, there's a space here in Hong Kong. I don't know if you've probably seen it. It's called the PMQ. It's like the old police married quarters where they have kind of art design, but they have a lot of retail stuff there too. So walk us through the, the container yard. How, how was that idea? Uh, I mean, every, everything for us has been really organic, you know, and, and honestly, the container yard we, we bought because I was actually looking at, you know, buying real estate condos in the neighborhood and the condo that we were looking at, you know, we stepped on the balcony and there was a for sale sign across the street and it was happened to be the container yard. Uh, or what we ended up calling the container yard. Um, it was originally the Mikawaya Mochi factory. So it was a Japanese mochi company, one of the largest you know, mochi companies in America. Um, and this was their original sort of L.A. based factory. And um, so right, it cool. was really coincidental that, you know, I mean, I, I sort of I, I sort of pitched the idea, you know, and said, you know, what if we were to buy this commercial space? Because, you know, this neighborhood is so hot and we're looking at, you know, sort of we're looking at residential stuff, you know. And so it was sort of shot in the dark and, you know, coincidental or, or, or I guess just by some sort of stroke of luck, you know, I was able to really sort of sell the deal. And. Um, we ended up with this empty factory one day and we we're like, oh my gosh, we don't know what to do with it. You know, like, we're like you know, um, and so, you know, we ended up calling it the container yard. It was sort of the, it was, it was sort of the birth of social media, you know, like, I mean, five years ago was really the time that Instagram really started getting strong. And, and so sort of, we sort of started documenting, you know, just the transformation of the space and. And there was, and we were in the right. arts district, and they had this like co they had this this ordinance which allowed artists to paint the exterior of buildings, and so this artist wandered in one day and asked if he could paint the outside of the building, and we said yeah cool, and and so all these people started driving by seeing you know people painting these big graffiti pieces you know in broad daylight, and you know sort of word got out and it was just sort of. It, it was it was sort of legally allowed. And so, you know, people started hitting us up. And that was sort of the beginning of of just this this space that sort of organically grew itself into a canvas for all these people that sort of, 
contributed their artistic talents, you know, and um, yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> it's a it's a really interesting concept, and I I read online when I was doing some research that the the pieces are are impermanent as in uh they, they're constantly changing is that right yeah we i mean we only have so many walls you know so uh we you know we started using more and more space that we didn't think we were going to use and eventually we sort of ran out of walls <laughs> and so you know stuff just sort of has to be impermanent if we're going to be able to sort of accommodate new art and more people and continue that sort of spirit of the space and i think I think everybody's been really supportive and, you know, we're really fortunate to, to be able to kind of continue doing that. Yeah, that's fantastic. So in addition to just sort of walk-in artists, uh, you know, doing large scale uh, artwork on the, the walls and the containers and, and stuff there, what other plans do you have for that? that space we've gone through a lot of you know we've gone through a lot of different sort of uh initiatives i mean we've we've done four different development proposals architectural schematic sort of um proposals um you know ultimately a lot of what we do here is dictated by whatever the current building code is and it's and it's actually changed a few times since you know since the time that we've purchased the building um, so we're sort of at the crossroads at this point, deciding, you know, what path we want to sort of pursue in the development of the space. You know, like, do we want to sort of pursue something completely large or do we want to do something sort of medium size and, and hold that, you know, in the property for, you know, 10 years and, and then sort of tackle something larger. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, that we're sort of at, we're at that crossroad right now. Is there any sort of retail or dining that's on in the space or is it purely just, uh, art? Uh, so we, one of the buildings of the four buildings we have recently converted into sort of an art gallery retail space. Um, we're going to be doing like a cafe coffee shop, but there's no restaurant alcohol permit yet. So you know, one of the sort of obstacles with the alcohol permit is that you really sort of need to define your final layout and how you're going to sort of um, organize your space, you know, and because we're not sort of at that point yet, you know, it's a little difficult to sort of commit to a specific blueprint and, you know, which which is sort of prerequisite for getting that alcohol permit. So we're, we're, we're kind of honing in on the final path that we want to follow. Uh, whether it's like large, medium, small, you know, sort of development. And uh, and I think, you know, then the alcohol permit and all that stuff, the restaurant stuff will follow right. after that. So what is the process by which an artist can come to the container yard and and uh, and work, so to speak? Or how do you curate your artists? Uh, I mean, initially it was a free for all, you know, it was like crazy. Like we just invited everybody. And then as the as the walls started filling up, you know, you know, it was just a matter of, you know, whether or not we had the space, whether we had the time, whether we had, you know, the manpower to, you know, because a lot of times, you know, we'll do all the prep for the walls, you know, like so if somebody wanted to come paint a big wall, we'll do all the prep for them. Um, make sure that they have a lift and you know so it was really kind of it was twofold you know it was really you know sort of to support the artists whether we could financially even sort of endeavor something like that um, but we would try to couple that with you know some of the development sort of I guess growth you know that um, the art would help with you know some of the, the the sort of identity with the space and the arts district and and kind of be like this sort of canvas to sort of showcase you know just sort of the creative element of people kind of rolling through LA. I think it's very cool. Is there any possibility that this concept can be scaled nationally or even globally at this point? I mean, obviously Hong Kong would be difficult just due to the exorbitant uh, real estate prices but uh i feel like this concept is uh something that could proliferate i mean i i think that i i think like i said you know in the very beginning that a lot of this stuff was sort of experimental um for you know sort of the real estate sort of angle or the real estate arm of the business i i think that you know a lot of this stuff is representative of you know a changing consumer you know and and like pop-up you know experiences i mean we've had all these different crazy sort of it was it started with the ice cream museum which was like you know a bunch of different instagram rooms and then there was like the happy place and then now there's 29 rooms by refinery you know it's like all these crazy social media it's it's sort of like replacing the museum you know and i think it's really just 
sort of that yeah. space is becoming a lot more, I think, flexible. And I think, you know, rather than signing three year, five year, 10 year leases, there's a lot of space that can really function really well by by sort of serving a multitude of different uses um, rather than being sort of confined to any one particular use. So I, I think that's what a lot of this consumer behavior is sort of starting to show, you know, this sort of in temporary kind of attention span kind of stuff. You know? Yeah, it certainly seems to be the case, especially with social media and and how, yeah, like you said, attention is so hard to get now. But uh, when you have something large scale like the container yard, I guess it, it tends to grasp people's attention pretty well as they drive by. Uh, is there anything else that you are particularly working on? Or are you like 100% focused on the container yard or are there the side projects right now that you're looking um, you know, into next year and, and this sort of thing to roll out? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the container yard, again, was a really great sort of stepping stone. It was an amazing sort of experiment. It was a great, it was, it was sort of a great grand creation of space and we want to continue building that. But I think monetizing all of this and being financially viable is really like the most important thing, you know, and, and to be able to keep doing these kind of things and to be able to kind of keep you know, recreating space and experience. And so I think, you know, for us moving forward, you know, one events, what what's stopping us specifically at the container yard is we're waiting for sprinklers. So we don't have fire sprinklers in here yet. So it's, they stop issuing day permits to us until we get fire sprinklers. They're sort of across the county. So that sort of halted all possibility of doing any kind of events. But we're, we have another property, which is less than a mile wow. away. It's not too far from the arts district, but we're turning that into an event space, wedding venue, something that, you know, we might be able to use both for public and private use, but also incorporate a lot of the creative talents of the artists that we've you know, sort of worked with and come across to to sort of apply in a more commercial way that can at least earn some kind of return to, you know, pay people's bills, you know? Yeah, I think uh, the, the f- financial monetization, that that's obviously one of the greatest challenges in, in any field. And uh, it, it's good to always be mindful of that. And, you know, I mean, <laughs> it definitely affects every business decision that gets made along the way. So Ash, thanks so much for the time. I mean, I, I Last couple of questions, I guess, if you had, based on your sort of experiences as an entrepreneur, restaurant, you know, doing restaurants and creative spaces and this sort of thing, if there's sort of one piece of advice for aspiring entrepreneurs or maybe aspiring artists that you could give based on your ups and downs, uh, what would it be? Yeah, you know, honestly, I, I say from from everything that I've gone through and, and what I'm still always learning, I think tact and timing, you know, watching what you say and how you say it. I mean, like so many of the, like, like I said, you know, with the container yard, it's, it's tough for us to like accept, you know, everybody, you know, like there's, we can't, we can't accommodate everybody. And, but a lot of times it's, you know, it's about the angle and the approach and, you know, sort of the, the pitch. And I, and even as for us as, as sort of an aspiring creative agency, so much of your valuation or your, you know, sort of ticket price is based on your ability to sort of present your product or your abilities like with high value, you know, and and I think, you know, we've worked with people that charge astronomical amounts of money and have no clue what they're doing. And we're just like beside ourselves, you know, and so for us, we realize, you know, like so much of it is about the tact and the approach and, and being able to capitalize on, you know, the opportunities that are really out there. There. But it's it's amazing. I mean, we've it's just sometimes we just pick ourselves, you know, because some people are getting paid these huge contracts and like they have absolutely you know no clue you know how to run the events that they do. But it's learning lesson, you know, for us. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's not, it's 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 so cool. I mean, I'm I'm really interested and I'm I'm gonna be following you guys uh, to see how how things build out there. I think it's awesome what you're doing. Um and uh, and I wish you the best of luck. Obviously, um, where is the best place that our listeners can find you follow you connect with you or maybe learn a little bit more about uh the work that you're doing uh it's mostly for it's it's been instagram up till now instagram at the container yard and our website 
I think, you know, we're really in transition, you know, because the creative space is amazing. Um, but I think we're trying to sort of create a new platform that, that can support everybody financially as well as creatively. So anyways, the website, the con- www.thecontaineryard.com, it's eventually it's it'll it'll show something different. <laughs> but thank you. Appreciate you having me really. Um, it's a. Uh, it's it's awesome to be able to talk about you know sort of what we've uh, what we've been doing. That's awesome. Yeah, we'll definitely get that linked up. Absolutely, um, we'll get it all linked up in the notes and uh, have listeners check you out on Instagram. And uh, yeah, thanks so much, Ash. I really appreciate the time and uh, and looking forward to seeing what you guys do in the future. Right on, man. Thank you so much. All right, take care. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. All the show notes and links can be found over at jkimshow.com. Come back often and make sure you subscribe, rate, and review. Don't forget to join us next week for another exciting episode of The J. Kim Show. I'd love to hear your comments. You can find me on Twitter at jkimmer, J-A-Y-K-I-M-M-E-R. See you guys next week. This podcast is brought to you by Hack Your Fitness, the high achiever's guide to getting ripped in under three hours a week. If you're anything like me, you're probably working a full-time job or jobs and trying to find time to balance family life, social life, and last but not least, fitness. Look, I get it. I'm a full-time investor and entrepreneur myself and father of two. So how am I able to stay fit year-round without spending hours and hours in the gym killing myself on the cardio machine? After struggling for the last 15 years trying every workout and diet under the sun, I finally designed a system that allows me to achieve and maintain single-digit body fat for life in under 3 hours a week. Cardio not required. Head on over to hackyour.fitness and download my free 13-page guide that teaches you the simple science behind efficient fitness and smart nutrition and gives you everything you need to know to finally take control of your life. That's hackyour.fitness.